I'm Barbara Miller. This is Adam Okoye uh, and Jessica Kanepa. Um, and we're going to be encouraging you, uh, like us, um, you know, letting you know that you too can contribute contribute to open source. And, and we'll figure out how to use the slides because the way we have been isn't working so much. Um, I've already uh, told you our names and um, let me tell you a little bit more about all of us. Um, I, I think most of us and maybe all of us, you know, first uh, met or, you know, certainly first heard about the Ascend project at Open Source Bridge last year. Um, and we have subsequently spent, you know, much of the year since um, doing things that we hadn't necessarily planned because we got accepted into the uh, Ascend project, um, an open source code contribution project that Mozilla sponsored here in Portland uh, last September and early October. And all three of us, along with uh, one of our other fellow Ascend participants, uh, participated then uh, in the outreach program uh, internships, um, both I and Adam uh, with groups at Mozilla and Jessica with uh, the OpenStreetMap project. Um, and we all certainly had a great time, and because this part of the talk isn't necessarily entirely well rehearsed, I'm <laughs> stammering a little bit. Um, but I, I, I think the next slide will um, give me some ideas for moving along. Um, what's been different and just wonderful, I think, for all of us um, who had the chance to participate both in the Ascend project and, um, and the outreach program internships um, was, you know, in contrast to more um, conventional education, uh, the Ascend Project Extra especially was just fantastically supportive. And, um, and I, I think if, if any of us who went through it could figure out, figure out ways you know, to make that happen again and again and again for people, we, we would, um, because it was just great. Um, and, and that certainly was a big help for us in getting started, and, and I think you know, one of the clues, you know, f for you who, who haven't uh, contributed yet but who are interested is, is finding a supportive community to, to help, you know, help make that happen for you. So, you know, if you can get your friends or your family um, behind you and supporting you. And then if you live here in Portland, um, there are all kinds of tech groups who have regular meetups that you might want to participate in. Um, um, you know, especially, um, I'm somewhat sorry to say for the ladies in the room, uh, the Pi Ladies group um, is a great meetup to follow and, and they have at least weekly meetings um, where you can come to a code and learn session, uh, you know, it's Saturday during brunch time and, and meet up with a supportive group then. So, but I, I would say, you know, even the outreach program itself was you know really just amazingly supportive in in getting um, getting people to contribute to open source, um, and I'll add in too that there's a similar program Google Summer of Code that that anyone who's who's a current student um, would be able to apply for a similar internship uh, through Google Summer of Code and and I think you know there too you know expect to get um, all all kinds of great support in, you know, making initial contributions to open source. Um, but, but I think, you know, especially the internships, you know, again, there's this huge contrast with conventional education because you have the chance then um, to work on an actual project that, that you've already made at least some initial small contribution to and connected with. Um, you know, you have the chance to work with experienced developers um, 
you know, you might in conventional education have a class where you're collaborating a bit with fellow students, but you often don't get the chance to, to collaborate with, you know, professional developers. Well, you know, in, in these internships, you absolutely do. And, and even in this, the ASCEN project, um, we, we had that initial chance to do that. Um, but, but the three-month internships are, are just awesome for that. Um, and one thing that you certainly do when you're working on an actual project with experienced developers is you learn some of the tools that are in use in software development. So um, you work with using an issue tracker or a bug tracker um, and you know, using version control like the fearsome Git and GitHub to, to manage um, the code or documentation projects um, that, you, that you're working on. Um, and one other key, you know, key feature of this kind of internship I, I want to mention that's, you know, just awesome. And, and I would encourage, you know, anyone who's interested in, in programming, you know, if you haven't started, you know, starting reading other people's code as, as a regular part of your, your practice, um, you know, learning to read and work with code that other people have written and that, that already exists and may form, you know, pretty huge body of work. Um, is, you know, is just great, and it's something that you don't find too much in conventional education. Um, and I'm going to pass the microphone now to um, my friend Adam, who's uh, going to tell you a little bit about the huge variety of contributions that you can make to open source projects. Thanks. So, as Barbara was saying, um, I'm going to be talking about the fact that there are a number of ways to contribute to open source projects. Um, so coding isn't everything. Um, I think a lot of the times when we think about open source, we think about coding because open source and software development and web development go together a lot. But there are things other than writing code that are or should um, be involved in open source projects. So translation and documentation are two big ones. Um, I think I'm going to talk about documentation or the need for it uh, before translation. but. Um, I think a lot of us have experience using tools that don't have very good instructions. Um, and you'll see this a lot in open source. Um, and you'll see it also in more closed source environments. Um, and one of the things that I noticed really quickly uh, was that when I would find something with really good documentation, I was really happy to use it and I would try to keep using it. Um, and to that end, uh, there is translating that documentation is also, and as well as uh, the things that are actually in the project, is also really important uh, considering that the majority of the people who use the internet don't speak English. Um, and there is also a great body of work on the internet that isn't in English. Um, so those are two things that are really important. And I know that a lot of open source uh, projects are looking for both people to write documentation and also people to translate both the documentation and the other things uh, in their project. Uh, visual design and UX are also important from both a, like, how does how to navigate this, this project uh, standpoint and also, like, does this actually look pretty standpoint. Um, and I think that that's something that people who have a lot of visual design skills, as well as people who um, are really good at doing things with accessibility um, are probably going to have a really good time with um, because I think a lot of times people forget about things like accessibility um, despite the fact that that's something that's really important. Um, and then finding and reporting bugs as well as testing is also a really important skill um, and a really important asset that uh, projects need. Um, we all know that things have bugs. That's that's just life, unfortunately, um, or perhaps fortunately, if you enjoy finding bugs. Um, but uh, it's always, I've always uh, gotten really good feedback when I've found bugs and reported them and been like, not necessarily being like really accusatory, but just like reporting them in a really neutral manner. Um, people tend to like to see that uh, or like to hear that. Um, and testing also kind of goes along with that. And then one other way to uh, get involved in open source projects are, is answering questions. Um, a lot of products have forums. Uh, there's also things like Stack Exchange um, where people are going to be answering questions. Um, and that's like, you know, if you know how to use a piece of software, 
um, and you find a question that you can answer, um, answering that is going to be really useful both for that person and then also for anyone else who comes across it. Uh, so learning by doing, uh, one of the things that I think both uh, OPW, which is now called Outreachy, and Ascend SIN project uh, really highlighted was the fact that uh, we're learning all of this stuff through actually doing it. Um, and one of the important things uh, about doing, or one of the important ways to do that, I guess, is to ask questions and not be afraid to. Um, I know I personally, uh, during my outreach project or OPW project, I uh, was sometimes really intimidated to ask for questions. Um, and then I did, and it was really useful. Um, and uh, I was really lucky to have um, a number of people who were really receptive to the questions that I asked. Um, and then also, I know uh, there are bugs in some organizations, um, or there are some organizations who, when they're listing their bugs in their bug tracker, they attach mentors to those bugs. Um, and so uh, Mozilla is one of the, the organizations that does that. Um, and those mentors are there to actually help you do, like they're there to help you fix the bug. Um, and so they're kind of expecting that you're, they're going to be contacted with questions that you have. Um, so I think that it's really important to utilize those when, like utilize those mentors when, they, when they're there. And I think next is Jessica. Hello, all. So in this next section, I think each of us are going to share a little bit about our outreachy internship experiences. And we're going to try, try to highlight the, the parts that are transferable to other projects, so things that you can uh, take with you to use in another open source project, hopefully. So I'm specifically going to talk about uh, my internship with Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Team, or HOT and some of the documentation and little UX work I did for their Learn OSM documentation website. I just want to interrupt for a moment. I just want to make sure that everybody knows the term UX. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows the term UX. Should we explain that? Or everybody knows user experience and yes, OK. I'll explain it later, too. Teaser, stay tuned. Um, hot. <laughs> Catch me if I, if I, yeah, never mind. I'm not, I won't make that joke. Um, hot. Hot stands for, again, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Team. And really briefly, they do some really cool work. They are a nonprofit worldwide organization that primarily uh, supports and develops uh, collaborative open source mapping tools. And they also mobilize volunteers from around the world that kind of crowdsource map places of the world that um, need it. So for instance, the Nepal earthquake, they were able to mobilize, I don't know the exact number, but lots and lots of volunteers around the world were, were able to basically map most of the destruction areas within a couple of days. And it was a pretty amazing. Really briefly, this is a little awesome diagram for missing maps that shows how they do it. We've got remote volunteers that take information from satellites and they trace satellite imagery and people on the ground can verify their work and use it for disaster response and other activities. Really cool project, look it up. Wish I could talk about it more. Onward and upward. Uh, most of my time was spent working on the Learn OSM website. And I'll admit, initially when I applied for the internship, I, I was kind of hoping to work more in, with the tasking manager, which used Python. And I, I wanted to increase my coding chops and look really cool in GitHub. And I realized, yeah, I was assigned this like documentation project. And I think I underappreciated how important documentation is to, especially an organization like HOT. But in general, it's very, very important because it allows more people to contribute, um, and it increases, it enriches the contributor community. It also enriches things like visual design. So other people who aren't used to being in the technical trenches of working on, you know, tutorials that I don't know take an hour because they they left out steps or are just outdated. Like not not everyone is the unique person who. <laughs> Will have that high frustration threshold <laughs> to, to work through those things. 
Um, yeah, so it's it's definitely a really important important thing that most projects need. Here's an example of some tasks that uh, you could get started on just about any uh, open source project. So test and run existing tutorials, if they have any. Hopefully they have some <laughs> that you can run tests on. You can find the missing holes, look for the information that's outdated, and update them, simplify them. I also had a unique opportunity um, during a mathathon to watch a tr like another trainer and trainees, mapping folks, use the documentation website. And I got to see firsthand some of the usability troubles or challenges with the site. Um, for instance, I got to see that everyone just went, they kind of, they skipped the, you know, new to open street map and they, actually they, this is a different screenshot, but they just went, they went straight to, you know, a wiki page and focused on one menu side of that because it was the easiest way to get to that information. So that leads me to talk a little bit about UX or usability. Hope that didn't hurt anyone's ears. <laughs> uh, this is a great, I love this diagram. Um, it's illustrated by this great designer whose name I can't pronounce. You can find here these credits. Uh, yeah, so we got the Eskimo person. Sorry, but that's not PC anymore. I don't know. Uh, we have this bundled person who's at the tip of the iceberg. And this kind of represents you know, the user's experience. And this is what you see of the website or the software. You, people most often just see you know, the visual part. But underneath it, there's a whole lot of other stuff. And, you know, this, this doesn't even have to just include code. It includes bigger conceptual things. So when I encountered some of the usability troubles with the LearnOS Insight, initially I just wanted to focus on changing the visual design, which is kind of the stuff closer to the surface. But in uh, reality, their problems went much deeper than that to include problems with strategy. What, what was the content strategy? What was the information that was going to be prioritized for that website? Because there's lots of other documentation sources. As well as what are the technical requirements of the uh, you know, web blog platform they're using, which was Jekyll GitHub Pages. And this, the information design and structure. There were, it was not only hard to navigate the site from the top part, it was it was also hard to figure out where things were in the GitHub repository where all the information was stored. Because since it's crowdsourced and there's so many contributors using it, people would use different classification systems or different words to refer to the same information. So there's a section for the same information here, and over here, and over here, and it's very confusing. So usability. I think just uh, helping an open source project identify their usability problems is a pretty big step, um, as well as asking questions about what are the goals and what are the what's the target audience and are you are you writing for the lowest common denominator of people? Do you want uh, designers and translators and people from different backgrounds contributing to your work or to make it easier f for your users? Um, you know, if your users are people that really like the trenches of technical I don't know, hardship, maybe not, but <laughs> if you want a more diverse audience or users, then that's a thing. Um, so yeah, content strategy. Uh, the rest of these kind of describe some of the deliverables or concrete ways to offer to help a open source project with usability issues. Um, ask questions about content strategy, maybe offer to come up with a new plan or, or talk to people about it. A lot of these last uh, ways to help are very collaborative. And that leads me to talk a little bit about uh, your kind of strategy for working on usability. I'm a newbie, um, and I do not, I cannot tell you, that's a whole other talk in and of itself. But I found a lot of support in organizations like Open Source Design, which is a collaborative of designers who work in open source, who are having these conversations right now on IRC or on their website or in GitHub about how do you collaborate and communicate with project maintainers to attack some of these much needed things in open source projects. Check it out later, I'll, there will be a link that you can get later. My last little bit is just I wanted to say that even though my internship wasn't very code heavy, 
I got to learn a lot about some of the tools that developers use, and that's always very important. So Jekyll, GitHub Pages, uh, Travis, CI, Waffle.io, lots of GitHub. Everything kind of revolved around GitHub. And that's really valuable and transferable. So even if you don't have any coding skills, you can contribute to open source. You can gain experience that will help you code later. And you can make the, the product, the software, the experience, the site, you can make all of that more beautiful and understandable. And on that note, I'm going to pass it on to Barbara. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you know we, I have it later. Yeah, I have it later in the talk. I'll show you guys that. Thank you. Hello again. Um, I will now tell you a little bit about um, my um, my internship and and connection with um, uh, the Mozilla QA Group's uh, automation group. <laughs> um, uh, for for my internship um, and my you know biggest contributions to open source of course have have uh, been developing uh, autom uh, tests automating or automating tests of, of the Firefox user interface um, and I think my plan was just to run one of those tests for you. Um, you know what happens most often with these tests is that they're run in a in a, an automated testing environment to, you know, to automatically test um, updates to the Firefox uh, desktop browser. Um, but this particular set of tests is also meant uh, to be something that developers can use as as they're as they're updating code and and you know building their own you know local development version of Firefox so that they can test it with the same tools that are used to test it before a release is shipped. Um, so if you will bear with me just a moment, we will get um, one of these tests running. These are going to be tests of um, the location bar, uh, the URL bar in, in Firefox. I, that that's absolutely one of the the things that you know connect you know drew me to connect with with this project. Um, it you know it's fun just seeing Firefox jumping around doing things and um, and I, I I had had a little bit of experience previously doing some you know macro um, development uh, you know for Microsoft Word templates. So um, this you know kind of helped me connect with the, the project. Um, um, but le let me see if I can get, um, get back to, and I probably have to tell it to present again, and, oh dear. There it is. Um, I, I can note here too that um, getting connected with any open source projects, you know, any any big open source project is going to have some kind of automated testing group, um, and it, it can be a, a great place for a uh, first contribution to an open source project um, because, for one thing, tech, uh, test code is, is really often relatively simple. Um, you know, as I was saying, something I'd done that was a little bit like it before was was just doing um, macro development, you know, in, in an office software environment, um, and the the code is is you know pretty easy to understand because it's actually you know in, in many tests doing things that you would actually do with with the software, um, is just doing them extra fast and kind of making sure that they you know do kind of the basic functionality that they're meant to do. Uh, the, the idea of these tests is to ver verify, the, the idea of many of these tests is to verify correct behavior. It's, it's, not, um, it, it's not anything more complicated than that. So, you know, in, in general, the test code is pretty simple, and it, 
I think it's accessible you know, to plenty of people who don't have a huge amount of coding experience. Um, and each I individual test, uh, you know, in test suite, there, there are going to be lots and lots of different tests. But e each one is, is a short project within a larger project. Um, and so they're, uh, you know, since, since they're short, they provide a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of feedback that, yeah, you're getting things done and, um, and, and um, accomplishing, you know, something rather than, you know, slogging along on a long project, perhaps adding a feature, which, which might, you know, be very rewarding, but it's, it's a different sort of process. And, and this, this is, you know, this, you know, quicker feedback um, that, that you've gotten something running, you know, can, can be great for, for a beginning contributor just because it provides that kind of quick reward. Um, you know, what, what's also true with uh, test suites is that the other tests that have ar already been, um, you know, been written for that particular suite will provide you lots and lots of code examples. Um, and what's also true is, th is that no project ever has all of the tests that it needs. So, um, so once you get connected with a, a project's testing environment, um, you have, you know, open source contribution um, opportunities available pretty much indefinitely by <laughs> writing additional tests for, um, for the project. Um, here are some of the key details for the um, project that I contributed to. And um, one of the things that we learned about in the, in the Ascend project was that you really want to have a, a list of, of all of these items for any project that you're working on as you're beginning to work on it. So, you know, first there's a location for the code repository. Um, you know, we used a repository on GitHub. Um, but though GitHub ha has an issue tracker, we didn't use that for our issue tracker. We used um, Mozilla's uh, famous Bugzilla um, bug tracker. And you can find the actual bugs or issues related to the Firefox UI tests if you do a search at Bugzilla and look for the product Mozilla QA and the component Firefox UI tests. Um, lots and lots of conversations about this project happen on IRC, and in particular in the automation channel on Mozilla's IRC server. The documentation for uh, the Firefox UI test libraries are, are at this location, Firefox Puppeteer Read the Docs.org. And some other great info for contributing to this project is at the A Team Bootcamp Read the Docs, which is a great overview of, of making code contributions to many Mozilla projects, but in particular the automation team's uh, projects. And there's also more information on the Mozilla Wiki at that URL. And I think we. I think we have a couple of minutes. I, I can say something quickly about manual testing. Um, th this is something that anybody who's who's familiar w familiar with using Firefox themselves can take part in. Um, you know, perhaps the the funnest of these is the Firefox test days that that are announced on QualityMozilla.org, and there's lots of conversation about them in the QA channel on uh, on Mozilla's IRC server. Um, Another place that you can find manual tests to run with Firefox uh, is um, using the Mose Trap tool and uh, it, this URL. And yes, we are you know, expecting to post our slides if you want to follow up on any of this. Um, I, I wrote up a how-to during the Ascend project, project on how to use Mose Trap that's at that URL. And I'll hand things off now to uh, to Adam. Thanks. Um, so uh, the project that I worked on for OPW uh, was creating a new thank you page uh, for Firefox Fjord slash input um, project. So Fjord is not just a body of water. Um, Fjord is, so uh, when you try and leave feedback for Firefox. Um, all of that feedback uh, goes to a website called input.firefox.com. And 
the software that runs that uh, that that runs that website is called Fjord. Um, Fjord is built on uh, Python using Django, um, which was really interesting for me because initially when I applied and got accepted uh, for OPW. Uh, I was told, or it was expected, that I was going to be working all in JavaScript. Um, and then a month before, I was told, actually, we want you to work in Python and Django. Um, so I had this really stressful, intense month of just like learning a bunch of code and trying to get really up to speed. Um, and it was it was a it was an interesting month, uh, but I actually learned a surprising amount in that month. Um, and then all of the documentation for Fjord, including uh, where the repositories are at. Um, where the IRC channels are at, where the bugs are kept, also which is bug, bug, um, bugzilla. Those are all at fjord. Um, dot read the docs. Dot org, and that uh, fjord's documentation is also really well maintained. Um, and it was for me, it was I would always kind of keep it in one window to look at because I was it was easy to find things, um, and everything was generally speaking up to date. So I think we all know that not all feedback is happy. Um, when you leave feedback on any of Firefox's uh, product, or any of Mozilla's Firefox products, uh, they'll have a sad face and a happy face. Um, and so my goal with my project was to create a new uh, thank you page for the people who were leaving sad feedback. Um, the page that was there um, was basically a, like, here's more about Firefox, and didn't have anything in terms of like, here how to solve your problems. Um, and so our goal was to create a more welcoming thank you page um, and to also point them to articles that might actually be useful um, to, the, to the issues at hand and then also welcome them to contribute to Mozilla because Mozilla is always looking for new contributors. Um, and like part of contributing is, you know, filling out bug reports and that's more or less kind of what they were doing already. Uh, so the, contribu the contributions that I made, um, I did um, a lot of writing of the code to direct the correct people uh, to the new thank you page. Um, so that involved a lot of um, basically logic and saying that these are the people who we want in there. They have to give in sad feedback. They have to be in the United States. They have to be using this software, um, which was actually really interesting and one of the things that was easier for me to do because it was it was just a lot more user friendly. User friendly, or I suppose the best word would be beginner friendly. Because um, it involved a lot of like less than or equal to, um, a lot of logic. I did a lot of uh, editing of Django templates, um, which the code looked fairly similar to HTML, um, which was convenient for me. Um, I did a lot of figuring out, I spent a lot of time figuring out which API, help API would give um, users the best feedback. Um, uh, Mozilla has three different help or three or four help different help APIs. Um, so I had to go through um, a script that my mentor had written um, and see it had basically he wrote it so that it would input a hundred um, sad feedbacks and then give me four articles from all four of the uh, APIs, and so I basically had to do a lot of like, this one works better than this one, and this one looks better than this one, um, which actually was not related to any of like the, the Python and Django stuff that I had learned prior. Um, and then one of the other things that I did, uh, which is similar to uh, Jessica's UX stuff, was that I sketched and wireframed a model for the new uh, responsive thank you page um, and that was actually one of the things that I enjoyed the most um, because I got to focus on things like accessibility um, and like what looks best where and what are ways that I can make this page easier for people to use and like people who are already kind of frustrated with what their browser is doing. So the takeaways uh, that I got from my internship uh, were to remember to ask for help, which is one of the things that I touched on earlier um, like I said, I had to learn Python and Django in a month, uh, and it's not like I could learn the entirety of the language and framework in one month. Uh, so I did a lot of asking questions. Uh, I was really lucky in that uh, there's someone who works at Mozilla's Portland office, which is just down the street, um, who worked pretty closely 
with the projects that I was working on, and he was a really great help and was also really always happy to, to help me with things. Um, and then also, I had to remember that everyone was a beginner once. Um, occasionally, I would get really intimidated by the fact that my mentor knew all of these things. Um, he was basically the project that I was working on was his baby. Um, he was the one who created it. Um, he was the primary person who was maintaining it. And so one time, I asked him how he got uh, started doing computer science. And he was like, yeah, I started in this year. And I was like, oh, he's been coding for longer than I've been alive. Like, it's no wonder. And like, also, he has a PhD in computer science. Like, it's no wonder he's so good at doing this. Um, but also the fact that like, he also was a beginner at one point in time. Um, and then I also realized that I really enjoyed designing websites and making sure that websites were responsive and making sure that accessibility was something that we were taking account of. Um, and it was interesting because a lot of the stuff that I was doing was back-end stuff with Python and Django. Um, but the stuff that I really enjoyed the most was with like Django templates and doing wireframes um, and stuff like that. And like getting feedback that was useful um, so that I could make the websites look or function better than they were. Um, and so I think next, we're going to, I'm going to give this back to Jessica. All right, here is a, excuse me, a speedy roadmap for your first contribution. Great places to look for our um, beginner-friendly open source projects are places that have a track record of helping beginners. Uh, places like Open Hatch, Outreachy. You can look at the participating Outreachy organizations, past and present. Um, you can do the same for Google Sum Summer of Code. You can follow your interests, uh, whatever you're interested in. I'm, there's probably an open source community and project out there that you can tag along on. And uh, don't underestimate the power of your interest and passion in getting you far, even if you know very, very little technical things. Um, I feel like that was my experience with um, OpenStreetMap community, very welcoming of beginners, because I like maps, and so do these other people. Very cool. Yeah, I will add that when I was applying uh, for my outreach internship, I originally planned to apply to several projects, but I got I got in the trenches of trying to set up Postgres SQL um, for uh, yeah, a bug or feature request um, contribution. And I, I probably wouldn't have been motivated to put, like, stick it through if I didn't think the project was so cool. These are beginner-friendly signs of an open source project. Um, they have an active contributor community. How long does it take for them to respond to a question? A day, two days, two weeks, two years? Probably want to stay away from the two years. <laughs> uh, robust documentation. Of course, the better, the more they have, the better, but maybe that's a place that you can start helping them out with. Uh, mentored bugs are really great. Mozilla, or Bugzilla has that for Mozilla. I don't know who else has it, but that's always really great. And uh, labels in issue or bug trackers, like good first bug, newcomer, easy, low hanging fruit. Beware the easy label. I think some people. Easy means different, yeah. So don't be don't be disheartened if you can't. Sometimes it means boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, these are. I'm going to share a couple of templates and checklists that the Ascend project organizers shared with us that were very very helpful. So first bug checklist. Read the entire bug. Seems pretty simple, but you'd be surprised how difficult that can be, uh, including the comments. Uh, interpret what you need to do. Make a list. I want to highlight um, under documentation, finding the style guide. That can save you a lot of grief to figure out how they want their code or information presented. <coughs> and this is a bug comment template that I think is uh, that we used. It's really great. And what I want to highlight here, and it's okay if you're only half listening to me, is that <laughs> it shows <laughs> it shows initiative. So you're saying, I'm interested. I'm going to let you know what my current understanding is so you know where I'm at. And this is the initiative I have. I found the code, the docs, the style guide. I've already set up my development environment. And I think I would start by poking around in this spot. So just kind of, I don't know, gives project maintainers <laughs> or people you're asking for help a little confidence that you're at least motivated 
to find some answers on your own. Last but not least, when you're stuck, communicate. Describe what you've tried and ask questions. Uh, it can be really embarrassing to admit that you spent several hours doing not a lot, or doesn't look like a lot. Uh, but the Ascend Project, they gave us this little, like, you know, what to do when you're stuck checklist. And just going through it, um, I made a version of it on my blog, is really, uh, it, it feels better. It's like, you know what? I wasn't doing nothing for those four hours. I, I tried all these different things, and I found 10 different ways it doesn't work. <laughs> Um, here's that website, if you want to take it down, opensourcedesign.net. I don't have time to show you how to find their cool ways to get started on usability or design projects, but the link is there. Um, we really wanted to get to um, this guide, so I think... We're, we're pretty close to out of time. And, and just, yeah, just check out this open source contributor guide. Feel free to maybe make your first contribution by adding a resource to it. And, and we will um, post a link to our slide. We, we will, I, I, you can say this oh, as well yeah. as I can, in fact, but we, we will um, post a link to our slides on, uh, in, in the session wiki or even if we can figure it out how to, <laughs> how to actually post our slides there. We will, but certainly we can post a public link there. And you know, if, if you have anything else to add, the, the session wiki is, is a great place to add it. Or you know, if you can if you can find out how to add things to this um, this guide, um, you know, that's another place great place to add add information about how you can get started contributing to open source. Thanks for for coming. And if there are any quick questions, we might have time for one. 